Rugby Championship final round, folks. First game up is Bledisloe number two. Fair bit of heat on this one, I would say, after the way last week's game finished. We're going to go through some quads, see which guys are in, which guys are out, some stats, predictions, and you guys can let us know your thoughts on how you reckon this one is going to go. But, um, yeah, like I mentioned, a wee bit of bad blood after last week, and the journalists certainly doing their, their best to stir that pot. Maybe that's good for the game, eh? Get a bit of interest in this one because nothing stirs uh, things up like a bit of refereeing controversy at the death. So, um, yeah, All Blacks are in a position to win the Rugby Championship, man. They're top of the log, 3-2 and two record. If they win at Eden Park where they've got a phenomenal record, especially if they get a bonus point, they will absolutely put themselves in the driver's seat for the competition. Australia, their chances of winning the Rugby Championship are pretty slim. They would need to beat the All Blacks, I think, with a bonus point and... Uh, hope South Africa lose. Don't get any points out of I believe. Um, so yeah, their, their best bet here is to just play spoilers and stick it to the Kiwis after last week. But um, for the All Blacks, they have had to make a few changes. Well, not all kind of injury enforcers. A few guys like Supaya was obviously injured in the, the Darcy Swain incident. Scotty Barrett, I think, has got... Um, he's carrying an injury, not a real serious one, but they want to give him a chance to recover. Harvey Lee and uh, Kane, obviously, smacking their heads together last week means those guys need to take a break. So there are a few changes uh, enforced on Ian Foster's All Black squad. He's gone with DeGroote, Taylor, and Lomax in the front row. So same props, but Taylor gets a chance. Tokiaho drops to the bench. Uh, based on form, there's no way you can justify that. But I guess trying to get, in terms of dropping Tokiaho, because the guy's been phenomenal. But I guess in trying to get Taylor back into form, there is some logic to it, because he had a bit of a stinker uh, in that loss to Argentina. So, yeah, uh, Taylor has underperformed this year, and it's a chance for him uh, to get back on track, I would say. And, I mean, I mean, I wouldn't have backed Lomax at the start of the year to be the starting tight head, but he's been in good form. So I, I will show some faith in the All Blacks coaches. Um to to try and get him back to where we know he can play. Uh, but I also hope they're not afraid to pull the trigger if things aren't going well and bring on Big Samasoni because he's been he's been phenomenal. Uh, Retallick and Whitelock, same lock and duo, and Whitelock takes over of captain as captain in the absence of um, of Sam Kane. They said in the press conference they would they thought about, I mean, Artie as captain because he's done it before as well, but he's only just come back into the squad after taking some time off uh you know on baby watch so um yeah white lock captain last week so it's a bit of consistency by keeping him in there now the back row is all different with yuani getting a start at six Papali getting a start at seven and savia back into the squad at eight so two guys who were on the bench last week get kind of a promotion and then Artie savia is back and he he's available you know he's gonna play so it's eight on the back uh, of his jersey despite sam kane's absence there's no temptation to switch him to seven which some people would like to see but also it's great to see Papa Lee get a start albeit at the expense of Sam Kane so I feel like though the most pressure is on Akira Iwane to to put in a big shift especially at his home ground he's a blues man Eden Park the guy needs to really put a marker down because he's not I don't think above Frizzell in the pecking order the fact they keep playing Scotty Barrett at six uh, means he's far from a shoo-in, so he needs to absolutely show us what he can do. Backs-wise, Smith and Moreland continue on at 9 and 10, so that's a bit of consistency. And consistency really seems to be the theme of what Fozzie's talking about. Uh, where there's not a bit of consistency, I guess, although it kind of is, Geordie Barrett moves to 12. Now, why I say it kind of is, is because from last week, Geordie Barrett played just over half the game at 12, so that's the consistency, rather than bringing in Roger Tuivasa-Shek, who is on the bench... Uh, to fill the 12 jersey. Remember, we've got a bit of an injury crisis with Goodhue, ALB, and now Harvey and Tupai are all out. So we are kind of running thin on midfielders. That being said, Geordie did play a decent amount of 12 this season for the Canes. And he's been talking about wanting to play 12 for literally years. Ever since back when Lomapi was at the Canes and he couldn't, well, he was keeping Geordie out of any potential, um, you know, 12 duties. So, Jordy Barrett, he likes playing 12. He spent a lot of time playing there in his youth, is what I understand. So, um, yeah, he reckons he's bulked up enough to play 12. So, yeah, we'll see how he goes. Rico is still there at 13. So, you could look at it cynically and say, we've got a winger and a fullback in our midfield. 
and um, maybe that's not ideal, but um, that is what it is. We don't have many players available. Uh, that being said, there's a bunch of young guys who you could bring it to. Uh, Will Jordan is on one wing, unfortunately. Well, I guess unfortunately, but I mean, I say unfortunately because I would have loved to see him have a crack at fullback with Jordy going to the midfield. But I mean, Bodie gets a crack at, at 15 and he came on and played the same deal. Uh, played 15 last week when he came on. So um, it's back to the dual playmakers thing. Uh, and then Caleb Clark is on the other wing. So, yeah, I just would have loved to see Will Jordan get a crack at fullback because that's where he plays for the Crusaders. And with that space that he gets, you know, he's really, really dangerous. But, um, yeah, they're sticking with Bodie. So we'll see how things go. I, mean, I love Bodie as well. So happy days either way. But just would have been nice. Um, they have made some change with the props. Tua Nofasi and Lolala. Remember, these guys uh, have missed a fair few games during this rugby championship. But they are back into the squad. So that's, I mean, I guess good news. It means Bauer and Fletcher Newell um, have to take a rest. Tupo Vai is back in with Scotty Barrett being absent. Hoskins Satutu drops to the bench. And then Christie, Tui Vasashek and Reese make out the back replacement. So Tui Vasashek, he's been playing all right in the NPC. He's been kind of ticking along, but um, yeah, he's had very, very little chances in the All Blacks jersey thus far, and it's taken an injury crisis to give him a proper call-up, but we'll see how he goes and how many minutes he actually gets. And then Sevi Reese um, has kind of dropped below, I guess, Caleb Clark and Will Jordan in the pecking order at the moment, so we'll see if he's able to add any value from the bench. Um, Stats-wise for the All Blacks, guys, I mean... Uh, Tokiaho is our top try, top try scorer. He's on the bench. Rico is our most defenders beaten. He's most defenders beaten the entire competition. So he is doing all right, ball in hand. I give him some credit for sure. Uh, Whitelock, in the absence of Sam Kane, is our top tackler. Him and Adi Sabia, really. Um, it'll be interesting because Kane gets a lot of stick. But it'll be interesting to see how the All Blacks play in the absence of Sam Kane because he does do a lot of that kind of workhorse stuff that maybe. Uh, he doesn't get the credit for. Um, Caleb Clark is our top guy for like run meters. I think he's top guy in the rugby championship for run meters because he's a big block busting ball carrier. But he's also got the most turnovers coughed up of uh, all the New Zealand players. So a bit of kind of risk reward with that man. So that is the All Blacks. Like I mentioned, bit of injury and force change, bit of rotation. Um, some unusual ones in terms of we're not used to seeing Geordie Barrett start at 12. Um, we're not used to seeing anyone but Tokiaho in the two jersey at the moment. You've got a hell of a lot of Blues players. Not a bad thing. But, um, yeah, we'll see how they go. For the Wallabies, they've also made a few changes. Rob Liotta, uh, Achilles injury in the last game, so he's out for a wee while. Matt Phillip with a sternum. Scotty Seo picked up an injury. Uh, I think it was Fletcher Newell that cleaned him out in that game. Went unnoticed, seemingly, but... Um, Apparently, they, I saw on social media somewhere that he would have got cited if they'd brought it up in time. Fletcher Newell um, taking out Scotty Seo, but um, yeah, it seems like it wasn't picked up. And of course, Darcy Swain suspended for six weeks. He's not going to be available for this one either. So they've had to do more changing, have the Wallabies, but like I mentioned, they will be fired up uh, for this one. Slipper, Poreki, and Alalatoa, that's the same front row, so that's at least one area that is stable. Although, James Slipper is like the most penalized guy in the competition, so... That's one area, like by quite a way as well. I think it's like 13 or something for him. The next guy is like 11 and the next guy is like 9. So yeah, he's getting pinged a fair bit as old James. So hopefully at scrum time he's able to um, to be steady and then not give away anything around the park. Uh, Holloway and Caden Neville are the locking duo. Remember Swain is absent and Matt Phillips. So Caden Neville gets called back up. He got a pretty nasty injury in that England series. So good to see him back. And then the back row has been where it's at for the for the Wallabies this year. I mean, Valentini has had to move to six. Samu stays at seven. And then Harry Wilson uh, is in there at eight. Remember, with Leota missing, they've had to shuffle things around a wee bit. Harry Wilson's had a wee while since he's been able to get a game. But that's a pretty dynamic looking back row. And uh, Valentini has just been in the form of his life. So, And then Samu as well last week was phenomenal. Uh, his stocks have really risen to the point where he's our, when I say our, Wallabies starting seven. Um, yeah, happy days for the Wobbies, man. I think it's not like the traditional one where you're just used to seeing Hooper or more recently McCright, but I, I like it, man. Something a bit different. Uh, Gordon continues on at nine alongside Foley. I think um, Lodicea was available for this one, but based on what Foley provided last week, uh, Dave was kind of keen to see Bernard get another crack at it. Fouquetti and Ikitao didn't get that much ball in hand last week. I mean, Ikitao had that nice tip pass, but 
Like, both defensively pretty solid. Fakete won a couple of good breakdown turnovers. Uh, Corin Benny right the two wingers, and then Callaway still there at fullback. Callaway, I mean, really deadly last week. Got a couple of tries, but also had a kind of couple of not his finest moments. So, yeah, he'll be looking for a bit of revenge at Eden Park as well. Uh, replacements, Fainga, uh, Bell, and Fa'amosili are the prop replacements. So, Bell comes in for Sio. Frost isn't there on the bench. Remember, Swain being absent. McWright. Nick White, Reese Hodge, Jordan Pataya. So the bench is a wee bit more stable. But, um, yeah. Can we talk a little bit more about Valentini, man? He's got, for the Aussies, he's got a bunch of carries, bunch of run meters, bunch of turnovers. One, the guy's just phenomenal. Icky Tal, like I mentioned, kind of quiet. Ball in hand last week, barring that tip pass. But his attacking numbers, like clean breaks, defenders beaten. The guy's been phenomenal all season. So, um, whatever happens, there's been certainly a few pleasing storylines for the Wallabies this season um in terms of the team stats new zealand's line out has been really good the last couple of weeks i think 100 percent uh for two weeks running now whereas the wallabies one's been kind of hit and miss all season it's like operating 80 percent across this rugby championship season so the worst in the comp um but with cody taylor coming back there's a bit of pressure on the all blacks to kind of maintain that 100 percent record because we did have some issues last time so that's going to be one to watch the Aussies have got the most penalties conceded in the competition. However, last week, the All Blacks actually did concede two more penalties. So um, it's kind of a mixed bag in terms of which way that's going to go. Um, referees can decide games if you're going to give away too many penalties. So it could be, could be a fact. Remember, different ref this week. Uh, both sides, I think, will be pretty happy with how their attacks were able to get going last week. I mean, we had nine tries in that game, a bunch of clean breaks. Bunch of defenders beaten, like the, the happy day stuff, but then the defensive numbers were obviously kind of bad. Like both sides in that game had their second worst game of the competition for like their tackling percentage, that kind of thing. It's just usually indicative of not a great defensive day at the office. Uh, recent history between the two sides, the All Blacks are looking all right with, um, with a 4-1 to one record across the last five. And uh, that one being the, the furthest result back. So that's back in 2000 uh, in Brisbane. The last four in a row have been won by the All Blacks, including two games at Eden Park, 33-25 and then 57-22. Remember where they played those two games at Eden Park in two weeks? Um, so average across the last five games is 38-26. I think 1986 is the last Australian win at Eden Park. And 2001, the last Australian win on New Zealand soil against the All Blacks. So, it's a long time between drinks, man. But 39-37 from last week is absolutely going to burn the Wallabies, guys. So, it may not be the Blitters low. It may not be the Rugby Championship. But to break the Eden Park and New Zealand hoodoo, I think would be a pretty bloody big victory if they could get it done. It would be massive. I mean, that's almost like 2001. That's like a once-in-a-generational thing, right? But it's a big ask because the All Blacks, they've got a 13-point points differential advantage over the Springboks. They're both level on points. The All Blacks' mission is go out there, get the win, get the bonus point, get the points difference as high as you can go. So, yeah, it's going to be an interesting one. Bonus point is going to be an all-important factor. Uh, Andrew Brace is the referee for this one. Um, Raynal is still there, but only running the sidelines this week. There was somehow controversy about that, but they always work them in teams, right? One week, this guy's the ref, the other guy's the touch judge, and then they, they swap it around. So no real dramas, I don't think. Uh, if you're in the States and you want to watch, it's on Flow Sports, Flow Rugby. Um, this game, the deciding Springbok game against the Pumas, the URC, the top 14, heaps of rugby on. Check Flow Rugby out if you want to watch. Um, oh, Predictions. Bookies say 15 points for the All Blacks. Rugby Forecast Algorithm says... 13 points, no, 15 points for the All Blacks. 13 points is the points difference. So both predicting a at least kind of two-try win for the All Blacks. Is it going to be enough for a bonus point? We'll have to wait and see. Uh, you guys let us know your thoughts. Do you see the Wallabies angry bouncing back to get a historic win? Or is the Eden Park thing going to be just too much of a big deal? You guys let me know your thoughts. And um, yeah, I'll talk to you guys again soon. See you later.